So it's nearly Christmas. What, only five days, is it? Yes, five days. And there's uh, many very interesting, or with a very interesting and, de- and demanding year, be- mostly behind us. I think we're looking forward to taking a break. Some are already in the break, maybe, I think. But it's, it's a break that we, you know, we spend time celebrating the first coming of our Lord Jesus. And it's a time to take stock as well, you know, end of the year and all that stuff. So I think we all need that, don't you? We need time to sit and look back and look forward. So today's message will hopefully be quite an uplifting one. I just realised that's a bit double meaning there, but anyway, about the rapture. But we're going to focus on something that can be considered one of the most anticipated gifts ever. But first, uh, hands down, the best gift ever is Jesus, of course, as a gift to mankind. That's why we still make such a big deal of Christmas. And it's not about the date, because we know Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. But since we're living in the time of history where uh, the truth about his birth is still somewhat acceptable to the Western world, and that acceptability peaks about this time of year, so we need to take that and run with it and, uh, and promote the truth of the gospel through the avenues God gives us. So you know, whether that's on the radio show singing carols or putting a nativity display, if they allow that, you know, somewhere in public, but let's, let's, whatever we do, we take our opportunities. So, so Jesus is so important, so we must never miss them, So those opportunities. But as for gifts for each of us personally, I think our subject today is right up there with the best because our topic for the today is the rapture and the reason it's such a great gift is diverse but it does include two main things we'll summarize as to these two main things being brought into a personal or the personal presence of our Lord Jesus forever that's one aspect of it and the other is to receive a new incorruptible bodies that is bodies that will last forever and they won't have sore points and joints and amen to that yeah so there are heaps of other benefits as well, many of which we'll touch on as we go through today. So you can think of this as kind of sneaking a peek at the rap, rap present under the tree before, before Christmas. But God's okay with it. He's fine with, with us to look at this because he's told us all this stuff. So we're just giving us what he's given, looking at what he's given. Now, I do realize it can be considered controversial placing a sermon about the rapture here in the sequence of our series. But I had to place it somewhere, and this is where I think it fits. Um, but uh, many other people don't think the rapture fits at this point. They think it's somewhere else in the timeline, or they just don't believe it in it at all. They think it's just a made-up thing. As for those latter people, we can have some amount of sympathy as to why that is, because, as I said before, it is kind of a crazy idea, isn't it? That people all over the world will disappear in an instant. Really? Is that going to happen? Well, yeah, so if someone doubts scripture, it's, it's looking, or, or they're looking at this world, world with worldly logic, it's a ridiculous idea. And they probably think we're a bit tapped in the head just to believe that this is going to happen. And maybe we would be if it weren't so clear from scripture that this is really going to happen. And we just read one example of it. But I'll show you others that are very clear in the Bible shortly. But as for other groups of people who place the rapture at different places in the, in the sequence of end time events, uh, they have many well argued reasons for doing so. So where we land today is where I've come to in my study of this over the years. But I'll start out today by just giving you the options of the views for those who do believe the rapture is a real physical event that's coming on the earth. So that's, we'll narrow down to that, at least people who do believe the rapture. And... Uh, and we're narrowing even down probably even further to those who are pre-millennial as well. Um, I won't get into that now, but um, so we're focusing just on that. So now the way we la- label the rapture of views mostly derives from where you place it relative to the tribulation period. And for those who are still a bit unfamiliar with, with all this, it might be sketchy on what the tribulation is as well. So you know, this is one of the things you've got to explain one thing to explain the other thing. So we'll... We'll just clarify that. Just remind you earlier in the series we said it's a time of great distress coming on the whole earth that Jesus talks about all through Matthew 24 and 25. And it's what much of the book of Revelation is about. So it's kind of like Mad Max situation. I haven't actually seen any of the Mad Max movies, but I, the picture I get is kind of like that. 
Well, one I have seen is the day after tomorrow, you know, all the events, things that happen on the earth and big waves and freezing and all that stuff. So if you remember that movie, it might, it's kind of in that kind of genre. Now, we may need to remember that the, well, we shouldn't remember that the book of Revelation is called that because it's Revelation, verse 1, verse 1, um, chapter 1, verse 1 says, it's the revelation, it's the revealing, the unveiling of Jesus Christ to all creation. So when we hear the word apocalypse, apocalypse is literally to take away the cover. So it's not so much about all the bad stuff that happens, even though that's part of it. It's about revealing Jesus. And it's a process for this to happen. So it's a successive unveiling of his righteousness through judgment and then in person at the end. And we've had Jesus being unveiled for ever since he was born, but it reaches a climax in the coming future. So we've also come across it a bit earlier with the 70th seven in the prophecies of Daniel. So I'm trying to pick all the bits we've looked at already and just show how it's all connected. So yeah, I'll encourage you to look back at those messages if, about you know, the Daniel blueprint if that's a bit hazy to you. Now before we get into more detail, let's just generally define the rapture itself. So that's the tribulation, that's where it fits. Let's generally define the rapture, what we mean in common language when we use that term rapture. Because many scoff and say, oh, the word rapture is not in the Bible. And they're right in a sense. That specific word isn't, although I'm going to argue that it very easily could be. Um, but yeah, that, that famous rapture verse in 1 Thessalonians 4.17 could easily be translated that way. Here's what it says. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds, them being those who have already died in Christ. So the Greek word translated caught up is harpazo, harpazo, which means to snatch up or to seize. It actually relates to the, the word harpoon. You know, and pull them back. So that's where harpoon comes from. But it's the RP part of the word there that converts into Latin as raptus. So that's the basis for our English words, raptor. So that's an animal that snatches its food. So either a dinosaur or a bird or one of those kind of snatchy animals. Also, wrapped. So you're caught up in something, you're wrapped, totally wrapped. And also even it connects to rapacious. So you're greedily grasping at food. So keep that in mind for the next week or so. <laughs> Who's rapacious? So they're all connected you know, with the English word rapture. So if you translated this verse as, we will be raptured together with them, it would be perfectly acceptable, I would argue, because that's how we normally use the word. So, But the, no one translates it that way because it's a bit controversial. But the point is, the rapture is that time when the church is literally snatched up from the earth and gathered to Jesus. All right, so with that, let's briefly look at the different views. As I said before, the rapture views are named in reference to how they fit with the tribulation, generally speaking. So in, in time order which is not the same as the chart I've got here, sorry, but it's not too complicated. So there are four main views, and they are the pre-tribulation view, the mid-tribulation view, at least the name pretty obviously, the pre-wrath view, and the post-tribulation view. So you can see the last two are the other way around, that's the only difference there with the chart I've got. And it's a, it's a good slide I found, it's done by the pre-wrath people, so they do some good stuff. Um, note that the, the rapture is the yellowy orangey bit, if you can't quite read it, so and time's going this way. So that's where they all place the rapture in, in their views. And we'll just quickly at this point touch on something else called the partial rapture view first, since that's something that can apply to any of these positions. And that's the view that says when the rapture happens, there will be a certain number of Christians on the earth, but only the ones who are walking closely with God at the time will be taken to be with Jesus. And the rest will be left behind because they haven't been good enough kind of thing. So... So that's just an overarching idea with all these other views and I won't comment further on it at this point. <laughs> so, like I said, for all of these, I want the scripture to do the filtering for us. So I'll let you think about that, what you think about that position. Although I won't play games with you as far as, as I said, with my view. I pointed out before the fact I'm talking about the rapture now in the series shows you I think the rapture happens before the tribulation. That is, I hold to pre-tribulation view. But that's all I'll say until we get some scripture underneath us to draw some conclusions. So yes, these are the four main views that are around today, assuming you believe the rapture is a real thing. 
And as you'll see, the Bible says it is, so we'll go with that as the underlying assumption from the top. So first, I'll just quickly explain them in a bit more detail. This is the pre-tribulation view. That's the belief that Jesus returns to gather his bride, the church, before the seven-year, or actually 2,520-day tribulation, which is all considered God's wrath in this view. So the whole thing is read, that's yeah, the wrath of God. Then the mid-tribulation view, as you may suspect now, holds that Jesus comes in the middle of the tribulation and God's wrath is only the second half. So that's that view. And as we saw a few sermons back, that period of time is distinctly described in two halves of 1260 days each. So that's part of what's behind this view. Now the pre-wrath view takes the definition of God's wrath to be different from the others and it therefore places the rapture somewhere in the second half of the tribulation. So that's the one at the... Hang on, go one more. There we go. Got the arrow right. Um, but it does have a lot in common with the mid-trib view. It just has a few little differences that push it further along a bit. And then finally, the post-tribulation position says that the rapture of the church and the second coming are essentially the same time. So Jesus comes down as we go up and we turn around and come back down with him as he sets up his kingdom on earth. That's the post-tribulation view. Okay, with that super brief overview, let's look at some actual scriptures and hold each one up to these verses uh, as scrutiny. So I'll go through these passages in biblical order. And we'll build up a picture of the ra- what the rapture is all about and then we'll go back to look at how these match in. So the first one is from the chapter I briefly referred to last week. It's Luke 21, 28. It says, well, Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and re- raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. So the phrase, these things, is equivalent to the term, all this, in this context, as you see in the diagram there, as we saw from last week. So these things, all this in the blue circle there, blue ellipse. (laughs) So when these things leading up to the end begin to happen, begin to happen there, that's when you should be getting ready to go. It says, look up. And why do we need to say redemption there means the rapture? That's the other issue there. Because that's literally what redemption means. As Leon Morris defines redemption, it's release on payment of a price. The price is Jesus' own blood, paid about 2,000 years earlier. And so he's coming back to take that which is now his and have possession of it forever. Not that we're merely his possessions, but that's one, one aspect of who we are with him. So, so that's the rapture. And that's consistent with more that we'll see soon. So that's that redemption is, is the rapture, I believe. So we'll start building our picture on, of the rapture um, on this page here. So I'm going to have actually be fairly small font because there's quite a bit on here. But Luke 21, 28, so that's the first point. It's a redemption happening relatively early in the sequence of end times events. That's from, from Luke 2, 21, 28 gives us that idea. Okay, next reference happens just down the page a bit in Luke 21, verse 36. If you don't get it written down, this, I'll keep coming back to the screen, it's okay. 21, 36. But stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and stand before the Son of Man. Now this time, all these things means the tribulation more specifically because the discussion's moved on a little bit. You can see, you can't get into that right now but just to be clear in my research I believe it's better to have to translate have strength there to be worthy I think that word has a more um, linguistically reliable background and should be used there so how can you be worthy to escape the tribulation do you have to be perfectly behaved no it's not about that is it it's by being in Christ by faith right yeah by having the Holy Spirit in you which you automatically have if you are in Christ by faith. So if you've accepted him by faith, there are two things we can say from this verse. Number one, the rapture is an escape for the worthy, in other words, for believers, and it's a good thing. People say, oh, you're an escapist. Yeah, well, that's what he says, it's a good thing. So we, we are escaping something that's pretty scary. It's the tribulation period. So again, there's my view coming through, sorry. So it's not an escape due to fear, but it's a rescue to be eagerly anticipated. Number two, or actually point three, um, we go to stand before Jesus. 
And it's also a very good thing, yes? <laughs> because we will be with him forever from that point on. Okay, so passage number three, moving on, is the first place the rapture is officially and openly mentioned in, the his- in history. And, uh, of course, it's by Jesus himself, John 14, verse 3. And I say that because this is the day before what we just read in Luke. Sorry, in, um, in Luke. John 14, 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. Uh, so Jesus, the carpenter builder, is uh, is building something for us. Sorry, something's bugging me. I've got to say, sorry. The bit in Luke was actually uh, in, the, in a few days before this John one. Sorry, that's correct. So, but this is the first explicit mention that Jesus makes. So, so Jesus talks about building a place for us. Like I say, he's a carpenter, or he can translate that builder. So he's building something for us in heaven. How, uh, whether he's physically up there with hammer and tools, I don't know. But anyway, it's it's going to be good. So some argue that he's simply only talking about gathering our souls at death. But when you think about it, a believer's death and his or her rapture is really all one and the same as far as our bodies are concerned. Not that soul sleep is a thing, it's not, and I don't have time to explain all that, but Jesus is talking about real solid spiritual bodies. Now that might seem like an oxymoronic statement there, but real solid spiritual bodies. They are spiritual bodies being every bit as physical as yours and mine are now, because Jesus ate food, didn't he, after his resurrection? And he they touched him and saw his sores and all that. So those bodies, and we'll be like him, he says, so they're physical bodies, but they're capable of eternity as well. So he's talking about us being with him in these more real than real bodies and living in real solid spiritual houses he made for us. Okay, so the other thing, who's changing address there? We are. Yes, we're leaving earth for heaven, not coming with him to earth. That happens later, I believe. So we can conclude our next point from this verse that Jesus is coming to get us and bring us to heaven. That's what we get from John 14, verse 3. Okay, the next one comes from the famous chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, and we had a large chunk of that read to us. And there's loads in there. And we'll just focus on a couple of things. First, verse 23 where Paul is literally, or he's talking about a literal resurrection. He says, But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Now there's lots we can say here, but let's simply just take the very instructive point that this verse in context makes a clear link between his coming and the physical resurrection of believers at the rapture. Can you see that? That's the context he's talking about. Christ the first fruits was raised and then will be raised, and he links that to his coming. Now, why is that important? Well, because we can easily get confused with all the terms that the Bible uses for the return of Jesus. You have his coming, his return, his unveiling, revelation, his arrival, his manifestation can be translated lots of ways. And what's that referring to? It's not not precise. So as I was looking into this, I began to realize all of these terms the Bible uses are most often referring to the general time of Jesus' revelation. So he's appearing, his all that stuff. It's all talking about the general time. And as the book of Revelation makes clear, this is a process which takes a number of years until the actual calendar day when he literally shows up personally at the end of it all. We could argue that's the start of it all too, but that's another thing. So with this understanding, we need to use the context to tell us which part of his coming, his revelation, is in view in any particular passage. So whenever it mentions his coming, we've got to go... You can't just take it directly and say that's one or the other. We have to look at the context. So here we can make the important connection that the resurrection of believers is definitely part of that coming. Okay, So that's what this is helping us see. So that's our next point. His coming includes the rapture or the resurrection, the rapture. Okay, moving right along. So we finish today sometime and not next week. Um, later in this, ch- that's saying something when it's Sunday and you've got the rest of the week. So you know, later in, this, in that, that chapter, sorry, we've just been looking at, we have a whole chunk that explains the rapture to us. And that's verses 35 to 54. And we had a lot of that read to us. Just going to pick out some highlights from within that. 
it would be, it'd be very worth our while going through the whole thing in verse by verse, but I don't have time today. Just uh, fif- chapter 15, verses 51 and 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We sh- shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. So the context here is that Paul has been going on for quite a while about what human resurrection bodies are like. That's what we had in our reading, all the comparison between all the different kinds of bodies. Then in these verses, he describes the moment that happens, which we will obviously conclude is the rapture. I hope you're happy with that. As he confirms in other places like Philippians 3.21, when he says that Jesus will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. So that's a, another rapture reference. I so just want to get that in. And it would be pretty much instantaneous, you know, twinkling of an eye. And I personally suspect Paul is borrowing language from Isaiah 26.20 in a passage which has many elements in common with the rapture, but being Old Testament still keeps it under wraps. Now I'm personally still working that one through and I hope I get the chance to talk about that one day. And Isaiah 26 is very interesting, but I'll leave that for now. But anyway, one point we can draw from this is 1 Corinthians... Uh, this one Corinthians passage is that at the rapture uh, the dead and living in Christ instantaneously get new immortal bodies fit for eternity that's what immortal bodies means so it's almost a unnecessary last phrase there but just to be clear but we can conclude a couple more things here as well so you can write that down later One comes from this language of this being a mystery. Now, biblically speaking, a mystery is something that the Old Testament never fully explained. But Paul, as an apostle, was given the honor of of revealing it. So the next point on our list is that this truth was undisclosed in the Old Testament era. It may have been hinted at, maybe in places like Isaiah 26, like I said, but it's not a fully formed doctrine until the New Testament period. There is clear resurrection like Daniel 12 and all that but that's a different resurrection I believe so um, I'll have to talk about that another day and the other point from this passage is that at the time of the rapture a trumpet will sound so you'll hear a trumpet or someone will hear a trumpet I'm sure we will now many people get confused and try and mix up all the different trumpets you find in the Bible and say and try to use that to predict the time and all that but just be aware that there is clearly a trumpet blast at the time of the rapture A rallying call, you could say. Now the next passage is the famous one from 1 Thessalonians. It's chapter 4, 13, verse 13 to 5, verse 11. And we could unpack this one for weeks, but because there's loads of helpful info in this section. But again, we've only got time for highlights. So I'll pick it up from 4, verse 16, and we'll pick out some points in pretty quick succession. There's a few here. Verse 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Alright, so there's another point. The dead in Christ rise first. When we put this together with what we just read in 1 Corinthians, obviously they don't precede us by very long, if you put it all together, but they still get a head start by some amount anyway. So... I'm thinking on the day it happens, if you see people start rising out of the ground, then you probably, you know, it's close. (laughs) So, uh, continuing. You know, if you just camp out by the cemetery, you'll be ready to go. You might be first in line. (laughs) Uh, It's all, we don't really know how it's going to happen, but God does, so that's the main thing. Uh, Then continuing verse 17. Then we are, who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to go meet the Lord in the air or to meet the Lord in the air. Okay, so that's important to note too, that we meet the Lord in the air, which is the next point on the list. And I'm combining a few things to say, make that point here, that he apparently stays in the clouds and doesn't come to earth at this point. As we can figure out, like I said, if you put that with John 14.3, Jesus is coming to take us to be with him. So we otherwise would say he comes to meet us on earth. So his return to earth is what the second coming is about not the rapture so it would seem that the rapture and second coming are separate events but we'll talk about that later so continuing verse 17 
And so we will always be with the Lord. There's that promise that once this happens, that's it. We're never apart from him again. Verse 18, Therefore encourage one another with these words. Now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you know, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Okay, so that's a well-known point, that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. That language is used elsewhere in plenty of places to describe certain aspects of the coming of the day of the Lord, as is the, the imagery of a woman giving birth. That's very common as well. But Paul goes on to explain more of what it's like for two groups. So believers and unbelievers, verses 3 and 4. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. So notice the them and us language there. He's, he's got distinction between two groups here. So there are two points we can make from this. Number one, the day of the Lord, or it there, the day of the Lord, comes like a thief in the night, catching the careless and indulgent off guard, but not the faithful. Well, it shouldn't catch the faithful off guard. They will not escape, which implies that we will escape, right? He says they will not escape. So Luke 21:36 sort of ties in there. And point two, sudden destruction on earth will accompany the event for them, not us. Why not us? Because we're up there. Yeah, we're not here. And the final point from this passage comes from jumping down to verse 9. And it's a key one. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I would strongly argue that wrath is the wrath of the tribulation. Now, some argue that it's the wrath of hell. But as you've heard me argue before, hell is the outpouring of, or well, it's not the outpouring of anyone's wrath. God's or the devil's. God's wrath for our sin was poured out on Jesus at the cross. And Satan's not pouring out wrath on anyone in hell. He's actually in the lake. The better term is lake of fire for the final place. He's who it's designed for, so he's not pouring out his wrath on anyone there. He's copping it. Um, and again, it's not wrath, so I'll explain that a bit more. So the lake of fire is all about those in there getting what they've always wanted, distance from God. That's what hell is. Oh, sorry, the lake of fire. Sorry, again, that, get that right. So it's the distance from God that you've always wanted. He gives it to you. Only there it's permanent, and that's eternal devastation. So there's that imagery of fire and all that, because that's what it is for your soul. And as for the argument that the wrath is not until the end of the tribulation, that's refuted, I believe, by verses like Revelation 6.17, which is early on in the tribulation time, and it says this, speaking of God the Father and the Lamb Jesus, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? So that's right near the start. So it's, I believe it's all wrath. So, so, he, so how does that fit in if, say, God put all his wrath on Jesus at the cross and all, all the wrath for sin. This is just him angry at the world because they've rejected him and he's working at, to make it better and this is what it involves to make it better is him uh, being dealing with sin in the, in the world. So it's, it's a different thing. But it is wrath. So, yes, uh, in context, the wrath spoken of here is all of the 2,520 day tribulation. It's the outpouring of God's righteous anger on this Christ-rejecting world in which we live. So the next point on our list is believers are not destined for wrath then. That's what we can say. Okay, next passage. And, and this one's a cracker, I reckon. I wish I had time to fully unpack this. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. So Paul's speaking about the day of the Lord again, and the issue here was that the Thessalonians were worried because someone had forged a letter as if it was from Paul, saying that they were already in it. So in other words, already in the tribulation part of it. So Paul had to calm them down and correct their understanding, which shows you something, doesn't it? it you know, that Paul had already taught them that they wouldn't go through the day of the Lord or else they wouldn't be worried. I hope that makes sense to you. It would all just be part of the plan. Like, oh, okay, we're in the tribulation, but I've got to huck, bunk it down because it'll get to the end and I'll be out of here. If that's what he taught him, taught them, that's what they'd be thinking. But they were worried because we're in the tribulation. We shouldn't be in here. 
And to explain it, he told them the two things that must happen before the day of the Lord can be present. So the rebellion, as the ESV translates it there, the Greek word is apostasia, and the man of lawlessness. In other words, the Antichrist is known. So, and neither of which had happened. So the second point there is easy to understand, that you know, he, he, the guy hasn't come yet, he hasn't signed the peace agreement and all that. And... Uh, but the first one has much discussion, especially now in 2020. So the issue is that the word apostasia and its verb form apistemi both literally mean departure. The word is away from standing. They're the two parts of the word, away from standing. And here's a flow chart. I'm going to get a bit mathematical here. Flow chart of what Paul is saying, just to help us understand, hopefully. So if you, we're worried we're in the day of the Lord. So Paul says, all right, well, has the departure happened? whatever that is. No? Well, you're not in the day of the Lord. If it has, then okay. Is the Antichrist revealed? No? You're not in the day of the Lord. But if those things are both yes, then yes, you're in the day of the Lord. That's, that's his argument there in that verse. So the question now debated is, is this a physical departure, as in rapture, or a spiritual departure, apostasy, as we would normally use that word in modern English, right? Apostasy. Uh, but that is not something we should apply back to the original language. That's bad hermeneutics. Isn't it? Just because the word apostasy has become that now doesn't mean that's what it meant back then. So we can't apply just because apostasy means falling away now doesn't necessarily mean it here. And if you want to get right into this, I refer you to Pastor Andy Woods from Sugarland Bible Church in Texas. He makes a very convincing case that everything, and not just him, there's many others, but he makes the clearest case that I've seen recently. So he makes the case that everything from the time of the writing of the letter, so this is the letter to the Thessalonians, the second letter, the fact it's called the departure, the grammatical form used, the broader and immediate context, plus the fact it was actually translated departure in all the early English translations, there's one that changed, and then everyone changed after that. So all these things strongly point to it, referring to a physical rapture. And if so, then this is an open and shut case for the pre-trib position. But you need to make your own mind up on that. Um, so if you're interested in following up on it, I encourage you to look up Andy Wood's messages on YouTube for as long as they're on there, who knows. So he covered it about three months ago. But there's a lot of scholars who are going, you know, he's actually making a lot of sense, so... Now, I have to say, Andy Woods is not exactly dynamic when he preaches, but he is thorough and biblical on this. So, Anyway, we'll include our next point from this. Um, that the day of the Lord can't be here until the departure happens and the man of lawlessness, in other words, the Antichrist, is revealed. So there are two prerequisites for the day of the Lord to be with us. Now, the next and second last passage that we'll be looking at today is from the same context as what we just saw now. Um, we go down to verses 6 to 7 in 2 Thessalonians 2, and it's still speaking of the Antichrist. And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he's out of the way. So I hope that picture gives you an idea of what I'm talking about here. Something's restraining him. So the big question is, who or what is the restrainer? And many possibilities have been proposed, including governments, the gospel message, Israel, or Michael the archangel. They've all been thrown up as possible, but all of those have significant problems in one way or the other, I would argue. So I think the two leading possibilities end up being either the Holy Spirit or the church. Now, to cut to the chase, I believe it's the church, because the Holy Spirit is never fully removed from the earth. He's omnipresent, after all. And it really only makes sense to be the church because you know, acting as salt and light to hold back evil, which includes the Holy Spirit, of course, naturally, because we have the Holy Spirit in us. So it's kind of both. But um, I think he's actually in his head when he's writing, so he's referring to the church being taken out of the way. So, so with that understanding, again, it only fits with the pre-trib viewpoint. But I am biased, so I'll just so you know. But anyway, our next point is the restrainer must be removed before the Antichrist can be known. So whoever the restrainer is. Okay, last one now, Titus 2.13. 
waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ. So the rapture is only referred to in the first part there, since the second part, which is in the Greek is separated out by an and, I'll actually put it there, they should translate that in there, waiting for our blessed hope and the appearing. Um, it's, it's showing it's distinct from the first bit, so that second bit is clearly talking about the second coming because of the reference to Jesus' glory in his return. So that kind of helps you yeah, when you try and work out what the context is, that's, that's that one. So the point we can simply gain from this is that the truth of the rapture is an amazing hope for us to look forward to. So it is an amazing hope, sorry. And don't we always need hope? Yes. Without it, we wither and die. So hope is so important. And Jesus gives it to us in spades. So some of you might be thinking at this point, okay, so you've been through them all, but what about, hang on, aren't there a few other passages? that talk about the rapture too, like Matthew 24, 36 to 44. It's the one about being one taken and the other left. And all of chapter 5 and several other places. Well, with all due respect, I beg to differ. So, uh, in fact, it's, it's the main issue with the partial rapture view is that it assumes the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25. That's the one where five are ready and five aren't. If that, remember that? It's talking about they assume it's talking about the rapture. But in context, it can only be talking about the believing versus unbelieving Jews at the end of the tribulation. So that's why I didn't include those passages. I believe they're actually talking about the time of Jesus' second coming, where there will also be a gathering, but in that time it will be a gathering for judgment, not for blessing, and also with a gathering for entrance into the kingdom, celebrations, things. So the, the ten virgin story fits somewhere in there. So... So that's, that's the difference. That's why I haven't gone to those passages. All right, so I've commented in, at some points on why I think the pre-trib rapture view is the, the view that fits most comfortably with, these pas- with, with all the passages. Um, of course, you know, people have other arguments and that, and they understand things differently to how I just explained them. But generally, I'll um, we'll just summarise now, I think, and I'll show you what I'm, how I've come to this. And just remember, yeah, you don't have to agree with what I say. You need to make up your own mind. I just preach to you as one who has put a lot of study and prayer into this and I submit it for your consideration. So I'll quickly go through each of the other views and where I believe they aren't consistent with the list of points we just built up. And the amount of inconsistency will obviously vary. Sometimes it's only slight and sometimes it's up to interpretation. But I'll, I'll give you the general idea with these codes. So I've got these. So you've got the... MT for mid-trib in green and the PW for pre roth in sort of an orangey colour. PT is post-trib in red and then I'll also refer to PR, the partial rapture, that's in blue. Like I said, that's not one of the main four views. It's sort of an overarching thing. So all the other three main views, I would say, would be at odds with the redemption happening early in the end times, early in the sequence because they push it later. Also with the idea of it being a real escape. It would only be a partial escape or no escape at all. Also the idea of Jesus taking us to be with him is inconsistent with the post-trib view specifically since in that one we apparently turn right back around and come back to earth to stay not in our mansions in heaven. And the post-trib view I would say is also at odds with the idea that Jesus will meet us in the air. Um, uh, And then, sorry... They agree we'll meet him in the air, but not descend to earth at that time. So I believe we'll keep going. Otherwise, why would we need to go up at all? Why would we go up and then down again? It's a big U-turn, as they say. Then all the other views are in varying degrees not truly consistent with the idea that we're not destined or appointed to wrath. And then with regards to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, none of the other views would have the departure debatable, but more convincingly, revealing of the Antichrist, nor the removal of the restrainer. So those other views just aren't consistent with that. The flow chart we saw just wouldn't fit. And finally, the other views are not really full of hope as much, or can we, nor can we properly encourage each other with it, knowing that we'll have to go through some amount of God's wrath, or at least the horrors of the tribulation to some degree. In a way, that's where the partial rapture theory also falls down because the hope of the rapture is greatly diminished 
if I'm consistently wondering about whether I'm good enough to get taken. You know, I'll, I'll, chuck, I'll put that one in there as well. Jesus is coming to get all of us, whether we believe in the rapture or not. If, we're, if we have faith in him, he'll get us. And that's that. And besides all this, there are so many other ways that the rapture is symbolized in Scripture as being before the tribulation too. I could go into all those, but I'll just mention my favorite being how the Exodus Israel, so they came out of, the Exodus went through the desert, then they only enter, going, enter into the promised land. So they crossed the Jordan, symbolizing the rapture, before the surrounding and collapse of Jericho, representing the world in the tribulation. And that seems to have been intricately designed by God to convey that truth when you get into all the details. So, but we don't have time to explore that today. If you really want to, that's back in the Salvation series I did several years ago. All right, so time's getting away. So what can we say now then? Uh, because some say, I mean, who cares when the rapture happens? I'm pan-trib anyway. It'll all pan out in the end. Have you heard that one? Pan-trib? And, you know, that's, that's good in the first case, but when you actually look into it, you get a bit further. And I'd hope you've seen that the event which literally wraps up the church in the end, and as far as we can tell, kicks off the day of the Lord, the beginning of the tribulation, is, is something that God doesn't want us to be ignorant about. He says that in one place too. So we need to be getting ready to be taken. If you know your parents, think about this, if you know your parents are coming home any minute to take you to a fancy dinner, do you just sit in your PJs in the house with a mess like that? It's a bit too familiar for a few of us, especially coming in the next few weeks. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a pretty young one, that one, that guy. He's had a few too many Cheetos, I think. But no, you don't do that. You sit. You don't sit there. You get dressed. You make sure everything's respectable and the house is a bit tidy and you keep a watch out, right? Because you're ready to go to this event. So it's not that they won't take you, no matter how unready you are, because they know the house is about to burn down. They're not going to leave you in it. All right? But it's clearly better if, to be ready if you're going to see the king, right? Especially if you know that that's the next item on the agenda. So stop wasting time. Let's not get distracted with the world. And guys especially, if I may get a little pointed here, turn off your porn. It destroys you and, it, and you're watching it encourages the continued slavery of those who are making it. So for your sake and for your family's sake, make the decision today to walk away from that stuff. Remember, whatever you do, you're making the Holy Spirit do as well. So turn it off. So let's get ready to go, shall we? It's kind of like waiting for Christmas, if you want to type back to Christmas. And of course, that's for all of us. Unlike Christmas, we don't know when it's happening. But we see that the day is approaching closer all the time, and I don't think we want to be in our daggy PJs when he comes, right? So let's be ready. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for giving us so much about the rapture, Lord. There's so much more I could have covered today. But uh, we are just so blessed to be able to have your word to read and to understand these things. Not that we want to try and pick a date, but we do need to know when it's approaching so we can be ready. And help us always to just have that motivation to be ready and to reach others, Lord, because there's so many people who may, will, will miss out. Lord, may we bring as many as possible along with us. So we thank you for this today. Thank you for the encouragement and the motivation that it is. In Jesus' name, amen.